All right, everyone. I think we're about ready to get started here. Um, so welcome to our repur repurposing food event. Uh, so this event is dedicated to uh, a couple companies that will be talking about food loss and food waste, which uh, if you saw the flyer uh, is a big deal. Uh, about 40% of all food is considered food loss or food waste. Um, so here at Plug and Play, we have a, a mission to contribute to this effort to, to fight this. And we've partnered with a four a representatives from four companies to talk about it, uh, from Planetarians, Upcycled Food Association, Imperfect Foods, and Renewal Mill. Um, so we're really excited to have the session today and, and share our thoughts in this area. So I'll briefly give a couple of remarks about generally plug and play, then I'll, I'll turn it over to Jamie to, to kick off the session. <clears throat> so if you haven't heard of plug and play before, um, uh, it's a great company. Uh, we've been around for, uh, I guess you could say, uh, maybe 15 years now in our current iteration. Uh, we started a tiny little building in Palo Alto on University Avenue. Here you can see the first office of Google um, outside their garage. And this is uh, shortly before they, they moved out of there. They had about 50 people in that office. And we rented some space out to some other early stage technology companies, PayPal, Dropbox, and uh, started this whole process of plug and play, providing real estate and resources for early stage technology companies to grow. And today we have over 30 offices globally and uh, over 600 employees and uh, it's all dedicated to finding startups and connecting with our corporate partners investors and mentors so uh, if you'd like to learn more feel free to reach out to your to us and and we'll get you connected here um here is the map so i mentioned you know there's a, a large number of offices abroad now um so uh we have a big presence in europe uh, china has its own division that uh has become a huge player for us um you know, and, and the states, this past year in the states, we've grown to a couple new locations, including Topeka, Kansas, uh, with our animal health program, as well as Fargo, focused on digital agriculture. Um, and I'll talk about Chicago briefly a little later. Um, but uh, the global presence has grown significantly. I've been at the company, I guess, only four years. And, and since then, we've taken on another 25 new locations. Uh, and our program, you know, uh, the food program, it just started off just in Silicon Valley. We were called the Plug and Play Food Program when we started. And uh, now we have to be called, you know, we were then called the Silicon Valley Food Program. Now we're the U.S. Food Program because we have Chicago and Silicon Valley. Um, so it's, it's crazy just to go through so, so much change so quickly. Um, but also you can see the other offices we, we've established abroad uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Milan, Italy. Uh, those are the first two offices we launched back in 2019. Uh, both of them focused on food, focused on food and agriculture. Um, yeah, we've also launched a couple other offices since then in Shanghai, China, uh, in partnership with the government of Beijing, as well as several of our corporate partners. Um, so yeah, um, a lot of offices brought each one of these offices has its own sourcing team working with startups and running a program. They'll run events similar to this uh, on certain themes, bring in speakers and, and startups to, to talk about uh, relevant events that, uh, that our partners are, are interested in. Um, so here's a little snapshot of the, some of the areas that we focus on as a program. Um, so uh, our program is mostly dedicated to food manufacturers. So we work with uh, kind of Fortune 500 food manufacturers, groups like Pepsi, Coke, Tyson, Smithfield, um, beverage producers like uh, yeah, Red Bull, um, Tetra Pak. There's, there's a, about 27 now, uh, large 27 corporations that are part of our program. Uh, and they're the ones that dictate our focus areas. Um, so they're the ones that uh, basically inform us how to source startups. And it's our job to find those companies then, and introduce them uh, via a variety of sessions, kind of like uh, somewhat like today or, or usually kind of uh, short pitch sessions. Um, but ingredient innovation is the number one focus of our program. Uh, our current batch had about uh, 14, uh, we're considering 14 startups uh, to join uh, our program of roughly 20. Uh, 20 startups uh, and 14 of these ones that we're considering are, are, are relevant to ingredient, the ingredient category within ingredients that, you know, proteins, sweeteners, microbiome technology is definitely a, a big focus, but we also have a, a focus definitely in packaging, supply chain, and retail technologies. You can see here in general what our, what our program's focused on. So if you're interested in learning more about, about that, again, feel free to reach out to your point of contact or me, and uh, we can get you more information, get you connected. Um, and, and these categories change over time. So, you know, that is what we're most interested in at the moment. But uh, as our partners change and our partners' interests change, uh, that'll dictate kind of the startups that join our program. So uh, if you look three, four years ago, it was completely different. Uh, so it's, uh, it's fun to see it evolve. 
Um, I'll touch briefly on Chicago. So Chicago is our next office that we're opening for food. We just had our selection day two days ago uh, where we um, had a, basically 30 startups pitching uh, to join the program. And uh, you know, this year has been an interesting one. Uh, like last year has been an interesting one. This, this one's kind of con a continuation, um, but uh, everything is held virtually right now. So we don't have a physical presence in Chicago yet, uh, but later this year we'll be securing space and, and starting our program uh, I guess in, in a hybrid manner, uh, virtually and in person uh, in Chicago, uh, hopefully West Loop, uh, if you're familiar with the area. So um, yeah, that's been something we've been focused on for a year since our last, uh, since our last board meeting in February uh, that, we, uh, that we confirmed this office. So really excited to get that started. Um, so I think that is the last slide, perfect. Uh, so now let's get to the more exciting part of this presentation and uh, Jamie will kick it off and start introducing our speakers and and get started here. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, it's definitely amazing to see how much the plug and play US food has grown. Um, and welcome to our panel, Repurposing Food, Upcycled Ingredients, and Fighting Food Waste. Today, we have gathered a diverse panel of experts in the upcycled ingredient space, each working on different components of the growing food sustainability trend. And this conversation really feels increasingly urgent. Research shows 30% of food globally is wasted each year. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, food waste is responsible for 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And each year, food loss and waste cost the global economy more than $940 billion, according to a study by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. And while the impact the food industry has on our environment is is quite startling. Project Drawdown, a research organization that identifies potential solutions to climate change, estimates that if composting levels worldwide increased, we could reduce emissions by 2.1 billion tons by 2050. Um, and while composting may be a more familiar conversation to those interested in sustainable food systems, there is a rising star in the space, upcycling. Upcycling is the process of transforming food byproducts or waste materials into new materials or products. Proponents of upcycling say the practice could help reduce the more than 70 billion tons of greenhouse gases generated by food loss and waste. And this is all while creating new jobs and innovative products. Up until recently, upcycling did not have a uniformed definition, but advocates in the space have been working tirelessly to create more standardization for the practice. Leading the charge on this is the Upcycled Food Association, whose CEO we are lucky enough to have with us here today. Um, and this group developed a task force that ultimately created that uniform definer, which is as followed. Upcycled foods use ingredients that otherwise would not have gone to human consumption, are procured and produced using verifiable supply chains, and have a positive impact on the environment. Now let's get started by meeting our panelists. I would love if each of you could introduce yourselves, share a little bit about the organization that you're representing today, um, and briefly your mission or vision for the world of upcycled ingredients. So Claire, why don't you get us started? Hi everyone. So um, my name is Claire Schlemme. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Renewal Mill. Um, we are an upcycled food company that's upcycling byproducts from food manufacturing into superfood ingredients and premium products, um, including baking mixes and cookies. Um, so I actually got started on this journey um, when I co-founded a juice company in Boston. Um, and it was in that role that I started to see just how inefficient food production can be. We had a lot of um, uh, byproduct waste at the end of each day, all of this fruit and vegetable pulp that was left over. Um, and it really struck me as like something that we could be doing more with and we could be doing something better to, to utilize everything that we were both purchasing and um, everything that had been, you know, had had resources go into it to grow. So I ended up um, meeting the owner of a tofu factory who has a byproduct called Okara that's coming from the soybeans that are used to make soy milk. Um, and it was like an instant connection of thinking like, you know, this is, this is definitely an inefficiency where there's a lot of value in this raw material that currently isn't being utilized. So that's what got us started. Um, we currently have two upcycled ingredients in our portfolio, the, um, the Okara, which was their flagship ingredient, and then um, an upcycled oat milk flour. So that's coming from the oat milk pulp, very analogous to the soy milk. Um, and then we utilize those in our own products as well. Um, so our goal is really to create a portfolio of these upcycled ingredients 
that can be used by other food companies who are looking to add nutrition or, um, or add a story to their products as well, since this is something that um, we definitely see trending for folks that are looking for more sustainable choices for their food. Great, thanks so much. Um, now I would love if Olivia, you could introduce yourself. And Olivia will be hopping off at nine. So um, around nine, we're gonna, nine uh, Pacific time, we're gonna start with a Q&A session. So if you have questions, hold on to them because you will get a chance to ask. Um, but Olivia, I would love, love if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm the Director of Product Development and Private Brand at Imperfect Foods. Um, my background is in product development. I was at Trader Joe's for four years, cutting my teeth, and I've been at Imperfect Foods for two years. Um, Imperfect Foods' mission is why we're here today. Um, we're sort of the other end of what Claire was talking about. We're, at this point, a larger retailer. We're looking to buy products like Okara flour to use as inclusions in baking mixes and other products that we're selling under our private label. Um, just overarchingly, Imperfect Foods' mission is to create a better food system for everyone. We started as Imperfect Produce, sort of rescuing uh, produce from fields that would otherwise go to waste. And sort of with time, we've realized this is such a systemic issue across the food and supply chain that it's something that we've used. We expanded into grocery in 2018, um, and we've just got a lot of exciting things going on. So I'm excited to be here. Great. Thanks so much. Um, now we have Ale from Planetarian. Love if you could give a brief introduction, a little bit about your background. Yeah, thank you, uh, Plug and Play, for uh, hosting uh, me today. I'm Ale Vincilenso. I'm uh, the founder and CEO of uh, Planetarians. And uh, we uh, developed whole muscle meat uh, from the byproducts. And recently, uh, uh, we even learned how to prevent byproduct creation. So we developed a technology that allows to make meat uh, from the whole pulses without uh, protein isolation. And uh, as uh, Claire came from CPG business uh, to uh, this area, we also were a CPG business uh, seven years ago. And uh, sourcing the new ingredients for my uh, in, uh, newest formulations, we stumbled a very interesting uh, protein in the sunflower oil cake. Uh, just here are uh, the numbers. I used to pay $5,000 for the metric ton of soy uh, protein those days. Uh, in the sunflower oil cake, they ask it just 200. So 5,200. This is the order of magnitude uh, when we can uh, use the upcycled ingredients if we want to make our foods affordable well and mitigate the risk. So uh, hoping that I can uh, showcase how we make it uh, down the road today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Very exciting. And our final panelist, Turner, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Turner Wyatt. I'm the CEO of the Upcycle Food Association. And we're working to create a future in which consumers all around the world can prevent food waste and participate in the best solution to climate change with the products they buy. And so we were co-founded about a year ago by companies like the, the three um, on this call right now, who are all members of our association um, to create that future. And since then we've grown uh, into a, a, from the original, these, these three businesses and perfect planetarians and renewal were, were some of the first. And uh, since then we've grown to about 140 businesses across 20 countries and we're creating um, and advocating for a global movement um, to prevent food waste um, and give regular people the opportunity to, to participate in that. Great, thank you so much. And welcome to all of our panelists. So we'll hop in with our first question and, and this is for everyone. What impact will the growth of upcycled ingredients have within the next five to 10 years considering a wider adoption across the food industry? I'm curious what each of your perspectives are on the core changes of, of this industry and how upcycled will impact that. Maybe, maybe Turner, you could you could kick us off, given that you're kind of working more in the advocacy side of, of upcycling. Yeah, so um, I think interesting to point out, a year, our organization is only about a year old. And that doesn't mean that the upcycled food movement started a year ago. 
all these businesses started long before that and they've been doing uh, great work for for years we're kind of late to the game just here to to corral everyone and to support everyone um, but right now is really the moment when we're gaining momentum um, in a big way you saw that whole foods listed upcycled food is a major trend you saw that about a dozen other big institutions like food network magazine and martha stewart and um food bev media everyone knows that this trend is coming so let's get ahead of it and let's use it to accomplish our goals as much as possible and the goal being food waste prevention um and so something to point out is, is that in 2019 when our organization upcycled food association was founded a study came out um, that predicted about a five percent compound annual growth rate of um, the industry which is pretty good pretty good growth um, and they predicted that that compound annual growth rate over the the coming decade but again that was before Upcycled Food Association was founded. That was before any of these trends predictions were made. And so we're here and we're building this collective to really accelerate that. If before this organization um, was founded, we were at 5% growth, let's double it, let's triple it. And what I hope we see, especially in the ingredient space is that as more and more uh, trends are, are predicted and as more and more consumers are making active decisions to seek out and purchase upcycled foods because they want to be uh, contributors to this single greatest solution to climate change, that companies, food companies all over the world will say, huh, we really want to get be a part of this. We want to be a part of this upcycled food movement, but how do we do that? Obviously, every food business as some kind of byproduct that they could commercialize and make money off of. But low hanging fruit, there's companies like Planetarians and like Renewal Mill and about 35 other ingredient suppliers in the Upcycled Food Association network who have ingredients that any food business could choose to integrate and include in their current products. And so it's really low hanging fruit for for food, any food business in the world to say, we wanna be more sustainable. We wanna connect with consumers in a new way. We wanna be a part of this, this um, rapidly growing trend. And so we're gonna go out and, and include um, some upcycled ingredients in, in new products or products that consumers are already um, aware of and already buy. And so I think that and take any, take your favorite snack, your favorite baked good, um, in the coming years, you're going to see an upcycled version of just about everything that you already buy. Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate that. Let me um, add, yeah, let me add here. So one uh, thing. So uh, uh, currently, uh, the environmental uh, aspects of uh, the um, upcycled ingredients understood by the fraction of the consumer base. Uh, and these early adopters uh, can kick it, uh, but uh, uh, let me remind you the savings uh, that uh, consumers uh, can get if we start sourcing ingredients uh, from the upcycled ingredients. And this uh, price change that uh, will make uh, uh, products more affordable, they can democratize the nutrition. So the proteins we, uh, that people might be deprived of right now it can be affordable for everyone and this is uh, appeals to much more broader audience rather than the geeks looking at they will uh, well uh, on the frontier of the food <laughs> technology yeah thanks for that Ali. i think it's interesting to kind of understand the, the economic benefits of upcycling as well turner earlier you touched on kind of the the consumer behavior component of it. And Claire, I know Renewal Mill connect, conducted a, a customer survey at the beginning of last summer. I would love if you could talk a little bit about some of the insights you gained from that and, and what are customers thinking about upcycling? Yeah, totally. So it's definitely something that we're seeing more traction around and 
more, um, you know, more understanding, right, of what of what upcycling is and more awareness of it, which is great. I mean, when we started when we started Renewal Mill in 2016, um, we kind of had to start all the way at the beginning and talk about like even talk about like why food waste is a problem or that it is a problem. But, you know, that that was where we were starting. We weren't even getting to the point where we were talking about like, do you know what upcycling is or does this kind of um, mean anything to you? So it's amazing to see how quickly this has changed just from a perspective of, of like a company that's been in the space. Um, so we ran a, a customer survey um, kind of at the beginning of the summer, and basically we wanted to be um, kind of tracking where, where people's awareness was around it, um, and, and not just upcycling, but sustainability more broadly and how people are thinking about sustainability when they are making purchasing decisions in the grocery store. And one of the things that we found that was fairly surprising to us, I mean, we, we expected this to be something that was, was kind of gaining some traction. That was our hypothesis going in. But we were pretty surprised that it was actually pretty neck and neck with organic um, certification in terms of the claims on food that people are looking for. Um, now, granted, this was, you know, we were asking about, uh, it was like stated behavior. This wasn't actually revealed behavior or anything like that. Um, but it was really interesting to see that behind, behind people kind of thinking about, okay, what does this do for me? Things like high fiber and high protein claims. What's the next thing that people are looking at? And to have sustainability right up there with organic really told us that that this was something that that people are really it's it's really taking hold as a trend, um, and we we definitely saw that trend stronger with with younger folks. So I think it's something that we're seeing. Um, it kind of tracks what we hear about you know um, the interest levels in thinking about climate change. We see a lot more action coming from younger folks on that. I think it's, it's bled into how, um, people bring that attitude and that, um, those values to, to food and to their, um, food purchasing decisions. That's great. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I think, you know, positioning in the market is a really interesting component of that. And I know lately there's been a lot of really exciting buzz in the news about Imperfect Foods. Just last week, the big announcement of their Series D at 95 million. Um, so congratulations to you and your team, Olivia. It's it's really exciting to know that there's, there's gonna be growth in that, in this space. Um, and a lot of, you know, what Imperfect Foods is doing is kind of leveraging that branding of being an imperfect food to uh, communicate with customers. So I'm I'm curious just kind of what, what that approach looks like for you all um, more on the customer education side of, of things. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think we started by making what was, you know, ugly produce cute, like slap some googly eyes on and all of a sudden it was much more endearing. So I think it is like leveraging the power of social media and customer outreach has been absolutely huge in terms of just growing our brand and also just spreading awareness for upcycling and food rescue. So I think it's something I think as all the other panelists have alluded to, like it's super, it's super trendy. Um, fighting waste is just so important. It's something that customers are already gravitating towards. But just I think I think the data we've been able to find from farmers, from food manufacturers, our own data, I think we saved, I want to say 50 million pounds of produce last year alone. So I think just like the sheer volume of what we're able to do just really gets customers excited to be able to contribute in a way that's not necessarily, you know, going too far out of their way. That's great. Um... Yeah, I would, I would love to kind of go a little bit deeper on this idea of educating the end consumer. So kind of opening it up to everyone again. Um, how is that education piece really working? Um, is it a product line? Is it marketing or branding, reinventing existing products with upcycled ingredients? Um, and as you know, plug and play, we work very closely with corporations. So how do you kind of lead those discussions with corporations? I can, I can start. We have, um, we, we sort of collaborated on a study that was done by a major retailer last year. And we learned that while 80% of consumers in this study would be interested in buying an upcycled product once they know what an upcycled product is, right now only 10% of people know what it is. So there's this big consumer education gap. And if we can make 100%, 100 out of 100 people know what upcycled products are, 
then 80 of them will go out of their way to, to buy those products, um, which is remarkable. And it's a huge opportunity, but consumer education is super expensive and uh, consumers are very fickle and um, they're hard to, to know about. Um, they're hard to research and, and understand. Um, and so I think that what's most important, and this is kind of the approach that we're taking right now, is that at least everyone use the same language and have a cohesive message that's consistent across the industry. And that's kind of leaning on the understanding that um, one, one brand, one company, no matter how big it is, and, and we have big, big companies in our membership now like Dole, but even Dole, they their megaphone is tiny in comparison to the megaphone of 140 businesses all around the world. And so if we work together and bring a consistent message to consumers that is appealing and fun, and we're all doing it, everyone in the upcycled industry, then it really can close that consumer education gap. And we, and thankfully, people care enough about food waste and people are interested in upcycled products just naturally kind of showing up as, in the world as we do in upcycled products that the more people who know, the more people who will buy. Like it's just sort of a natural thing about it appears because there's been a, a few studies actually over the last couple of years that have, have corroborated this one and, and shown on average, most people, once they understand what upcycled is, they're going to go out of their way to buy it. So now we just have to make sure people understand what it is. Um, and so we're really excited to be working with brands like these to get that message out into the world. Yeah, Could so I know you have uh, been working on a certification, that kind of standardization piece that was previously missing from upcycling. Could you touch a little bit deeper on that and, and I'm curious, when will consumers actually start seeing certified upcycled products in the market with that kind of stamp of approval on the packaging? As soon as this summer, where it's, we've been working on this product certification, product and ingredient certification. Um, and so there's a distinction so that like on Renewal Mills CPGs and on the new partnership that Imperfect has with another one of our members, Fancy Pants, um, the, some cookies that actually use some renewal mill flour in them on CPGs and consumer products like that, you'll see a logo on pack that communicates, yes, this, this product contributes to the single greatest solution to climate change. And by purchasing it, you are participating in that solution. But then also it's an ingredient certification so that when Ali is going out to his customers, other businesses selling his ingredients, he gets to say, hey, this is a certified ingredient. Therefore, it enhances um, people's willingness to pay for your product and makes this ingredient more exciting. And so for both of those, um, you'll start seeing certified, um, upcycled certified products and ingredients as soon as this summer. We've been working on this program for over a year now and um, worked with just some geniuses, world experts um, in the space to develop this tool which is really an, a consumer education tool. Um, and it's gonna be printed on millions of um, packages all over the world. And um, we're super excited. And um, so you're gonna see fairly shortly a, a new website around um, the certification. The logo is so close to being done. It's beautiful. I can't wait to share it with, with everyone what the actual logo on, on packaging is gonna look like. Um, but yeah, it, within the next, um, few months, we'll start accepting applications to that for any uh, upcycled entrepreneurs out there listening. And then shortly, you know, after when people, you know, get their packaging um, runs through and, um, and then we'll, we'll start seeing the label on packaging then. That's very exciting. Um, Claire and Olivia, so I know you're, you're both, you know, very much consumer customer facing. I'm curious what kind of misconceptions or misunderstanding maybe some of the consumers have had around upcycled ingredients and, and how you've been able to navigate and communicate about that. Oh, Claire, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I think that um, it's, it's a lot about talking. I think for us, it's been a lot about talking about the process because um, I think 
for for us it's really it's it it's easy to understand if you kind of describe like, hey, there's like a soy milk machine and out of this one side comes the soy milk and out of the other side comes the okara. And we just arbitrarily call the okara waste because there isn't, there hasn't been historically something that we do with it here in the US. Um, and when people see it as as like an ingredient and something that kind of has that that clean um, halo around it, it's, it really changes what how people think about it as upcycling. Because I think the, the main issue that, you know, you might run into is like, wait, this is trash or, you know, this was waste and, and using those words. But, but I will say that actually we have not had as much, um, I, I, we haven't had as much like misunderstanding or some like um, problems with it as I expected. So when we first started out, our hypothesis was like, oh, we need to avoid the, like the word waste at all costs. And in fact, um, because that, because there's been so much, um, education around food waste and, and, um, and as Turner's been talking about, you know, people really are beginning to understand that this is something that we need to address to, to fight climate change. Um, using that word on pack and using it in our marketing has actually been, uh, something that's been pretty engaging for folks. So it hasn't, it hasn't had the negative impact that we originally thought that it would, um, but it, it, I will say that when most people are familiar with the term upcycling, it's usually not in the food space. So it's something, you know, maybe like from um, like upcycling your old sweaters into a new product or something. So I think that there's still a lot more, um, a lot more kind of understanding of that word outside of food. So it's, it's really kind of having people understand how it, how it applies to food. Great. Olivia, any insights into this? Yeah, I think for me, as someone who's seen kind of all sides of the food system and manufacturing, it's very much like I, there are a lot of things I can be cynical about, but the one thing I think in upcycling is that we're already consuming so much upcycled product without knowing, like peanut butter, broken peanuts, tomato sauce made with number twos, applesauce, same thing. So I think for us, it's being able to tell that story for products that everyone is familiar with. And it's like, these things are already at home in your pantry. You feed them to your kids, they're fine. We've been eating this for decades. So I think it's building on the fact that we're already doing okay. We can, there are many opportunities for improvement, but I think, yeah, just continuing to build that narrative on what customers are already familiar with. That's interesting. I think Claire, you had previously shared with me the origins of a tater tot and that you know a tater tot might be one of those the most unknown upcycled foods out there they actually came from the byproduct of potatoes yeah, exactly um so i think consumers you know don't necessarily know but they're they're already consuming um a lot of upcycled ingredients and giving a name to it actually um you know will help promote the sustainability components of it all i i would i would love to ask you um since you are part of plug and play and our our corporate innovation platform. You've worked with large corporations. I'm curious, curious what that experience has been like for you navigating, uh, having an upcycling startup while working with large corporations. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jamie. Uh, yeah, we had the luck uh, to work with a lot of uh, corporations, uh, and I would say that they want to collaborate. Uh, they establish a special uh, open innovation departments, uh, even venture arms. Yeah. Uh, to uh, scout uh, and bring the new technologies uh, into their uh, to improve their businesses. But what we've learned, uh, uh, it's very hard uh, to change what's already working and bring money inside the big corporations. Mm -hmm. So the uh, bureaucratic uh, procedures uh, and the risks that uh, prevent to doing that the didn't uh, allow even companies who invested. For instance, we had a be uh, beautiful collaboration uh, and investment uh, from Bar Barilla Venture Arm. So uh, they invited us uh, to their R&D facility. So we made uh, multiple applications. Uh, my best love it is a black pasta. But uh, when it came to the decision, uh, should we bring it to the market? Uh, there was a big uh, question, uh, can we jeopardize Barilla brand uh, releasing the black, absolutely black, not usual product. So, uh, and uh, so, uh, so uh, but this is just the things how they are. Uh, 
Uh, so, um, uh, but we continue engage with the uh, big uh, corporations because we thought that uh, if we onboard uh, companies who already in all those uh, uh, channels, uh, so they have the big manufacturing uh, facilities, it uh, pr uh, will bring changes to the market faster. And the best example of uh, collaboration uh, we observed uh, last year when we, instead of uh, pushing them, invited to collaborate. So uh, in uh, March last year, we developed uh, a new layer of our uh, technology. And uh, since uh, COVID closed well, almost every opportunity to uh, do something, so, uh, we decided to invite uh, uh, companies to collaborate. Clextral, the extrusion partner, uh, said, well, we have the uh, empty uh, pilot facility these days because of COVID, so maybe we can allow you to work that. Mm -hmm. Bungie said, well, since you valorize uh, uh, some flour that we process, well, let us provide you uh, the uh, ingredients for free. It was expected. But uh, they also offered uh, the analysis uh, uh, to run uh, before and after to, uh, to help us better quantify their uh, results. Uh, and then uh, Jivadan joined uh, with their flavors and offered uh, the application prototyping. So, and we found that co-creation, when you co-create something new, then we, they are part of that, uh, move the ball uh, significantly faster. Uh, and we're right now in the next phase of uh, those results. So um, uh, I highly encourage uh, the startup companies and te uh, technology developers to engage uh, and find your way how you can uh, uh, co-create. Great. On that piece of, you know, it's definitely a call to action to, to some of the corporates on the call, like this is an accessible thing that you can do. You can be a part of this movement. I'm curious if any of our panelists um, can share a little bit deeper what are the best ways maybe for a corporation to engage with upcycling? What's that kind of first easy step into to upcycling? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, first is getting acquainted with the UFA. I think that's a great, a great first step. There's a lot of resources um, that, that Turner's put together um, and it's a, it's a great kind of gateway into the space. Um, I think that it's also, you know, for us, uh, for our ingredient supply side of what we do, um, we usually start by just, um, you know, connecting with the R&D department at a, at a food company that's interested in exploring what can be done with, with these upcycled ingredients. Um, and depending on what the innovation um, plans are or the goals are for the company, we basically create, create a, a program for the company that allows us to, um, to showcase what these upcycled ingredients are and how they might fit into the portfolio of the company that that's looking to, to do something with upcycled. So that, you know, it, it, there's a lot of different ways that you might come to upcycled, right? It might be because you're looking for um, more nutrition, like a bigger nutritional boost that you're getting to your product. You want to, you want to get those um, high fiber or high pro protein claims on front of pack. Upcycled ingredients are a great way to do that. Um, and and there, there may be a cost play there. If you're using an ingredient that has kind of an analog in the upcycled space, you may be able to find a cheaper way to, um, to have that, uh, to, have, to be able to make your product. Um, and you might want the marketing story behind it. That might be the driver. So there's a lot of different ways that you might wanna be coming to upcycled ingredients. And I think, um, as I mentioned, I think the, the UFA is a great way to, to kind of get your feet wet in the space. And then reaching out to the companies that are part of UFA that have these upcycled ingredients, ones that you think might be a good fit, um, ones that the R&D team is, is interested in exploring, and then get a sense of what those upcycled ingredients can do and, and how they might fit with your own um, innovation goals in, in food development. Great. Any of our other panelists um, can expand on on this idea of how corporations can engage. Um, I can add to that. I agree with everything Claire said, but I think on the front end, the only thing I would add would be intent. I think there there are just so many things. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to meeting the bottom line. So I think it's it's easy to overlook things that are important, but I think it's just like taking a step back looking at your own supply chain even, 
Um, right now I'm working with a, a cold brew coffee manufacturer who has thousands of pounds of spent grounds every week. And they have nothing, like they're trying to sell them for compost. They have nothing to do with them. So there are so many, so many, I guess, opportunities in existing supply chains already that I think just being sort of reflective and self-critical is a huge step in wanting to sort of bring in more upcycled ingredients and even find solutions for them. And it kind of, kind of starts with, like, like you said, Olivia, recognizing the problem. And I think the power that this movement has is to elevate people's understanding that coffee, spent coffee grounds is an ingredient. It's a valuable ingredient that you could be making money off of instead of paying someone to come haul it off of your, your premises, you could be making money off of it. And so to kind of just make that paradigm switch for powerful people within the food system to say, Hey, why aren't we, why aren't we making money? So-and-so is, is, uh, using their, you know, the Okara from, from soy milk production to, and they're making money. Why aren't we doing that? Um, and I think eventually, like very practically speaking, what these two ladies said is, is totally true. And where we're going, I think is so exciting because it's a circular economy of food. It's a food system, food system in which by design, every time there's a, a waste of opportunity for something to go to waste, it's just automatically being thought of as an ingredient and therefore seeking out ways to implement that ingredient into new products that are also worth money and, and sold to consumers. So it's like this, this, um, self, um, correcting system that by design, um, sort of eliminates waste by redefining waste. Waste is really just a, it's sort of a, a figment of our imagination. Just if you go, if you go somewhere else in the world, they're already doing this. Or, um, if you, you know, go into the, into the future, hopefully all of these ingredients will be utilized. So it's, it's like Claire used the word arbitrary, totally arbitrary, which of these ingredients we, we use and which ones we don't. And so by raising awareness for, you know, people who care about businesses making money in the food system, you can say, hey, you should be, you should be making money off of this too. That's great. Um, yeah, I think it's it's very clear that there are a lot of advantages to upcycling, um, you know, for corporations, for, for startups. So I'm curious if we can even dive deeper into this. We've talked about, um, you know, cost avoidance a little bit, um, nutritional aspect a little bit, but I, I would love to hear more examples of, of instances you all have seen um, out there in the world about how upcycling can be really, really beneficial in maybe ways that we're not thinking of already. One thing that I'll mention too is, is the impact that this can have on agriculture. And it's important because if you look across our food system, who are the people who are historically the most um, exploited, least paid, and yet they're the most important. It's farmers and producers. And I think like the, the uh, sort of pioneers in this imperfect, they kind of showed the world that, you know, we're, we're putting energy, farmers are putting energy into creating all the food that they're producing, even the ugly ones, but they're only getting paid for the pretty ones. That's not fair. And in the same way, um, you know, the people who are producing the soy or sunflowers that are ultimately getting made into the various products that they, they are, they're only getting paid for the, the tofu or the soy milk or the sunflower seeds and not the, the proteins and the, the fibers and the ingredients that planetarians and renewal mill are using. And so they're only getting paid a fraction of what they deserve and really clear, uh, examples of this are in cascara and cacao fruit, two of the most commonly used upcycled ingredients in our membership. The fruit from the coffee plant, which most people don't realize exists, and the fruit from the cacao plant. We take the seeds out in both cases to make coffee and chocolate. 
there's all this delicious, nutritious fruit left over. And so you have farmers in the global South producing cacao fruit, producing uh, coffee fruit and not getting paid for it. And so this is a tool to make our food system more equitable, to improve the quality of life of farmers and producers all over the world by giving credit where credit's due. We don't, we don't produce the cacao fruit and get this cacao seeds and get the pod and the fruit for free. You don't, you don't produce the pretty produce and get the ugly ones for free. We're all paying for it. Farmers are paying for it. The environment is paying for it. And so by fixing the, the problems that we're experiencing in the environment, we're also helping to address some of the inequities um, and injustices that are experienced by farmers and producers within the food system. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so uh, a little bit deeper. So I'm biased uh, on the proteins. So, so all, all my examples maybe uh, come around the proteins. But uh, 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 let's uh, have a look at the uh, outcome for the A, B, and DEF. Uh, then they started uh, exploring what they have uh, in the, their byproducts, uh, except uh, the, uh, the beer. So uh, first they realized that uh, the waste waters are full of nutrients and that they can uh, ferment into the meat uh, and the company Meaty uh, right now makes the fermented meat, uh, whole cut meats uh, straight uh, from the uh, waste waters of the uh, breweries. Then they started to uh, uh, understand that yeast uh, that they uh, use, uh, it's a single cell protein that it uh, can be added to uh, a, a lot of products uh, and not only as the uh, protein source but also improve the taste to provide the umami uh, taste uh, of the food products and the most uh, recent <laughs> uh, effect they found uh, that they can uh, make uh, if they process further the byproducts the uh, uh, European company Fumi, uh, they make the egg replacers. So uh, from the same waste that we have. So, uh, and the last piece uh, that, that then they calculated so their current uh, fermentation capacity that they have right now uh, for the beer. So uh, they can uh, produce all the meat we need uh, to feed the world today with the existing capacity. So uh, uh, I encourage, uh, well, to dive deeper into the industrial uh, waste streams. Uh, they are uh, more abundant uh, and maybe sometimes easier to work with because uh, they are single stream streams. Yeah. Interesting. Ollie, I, I would love to uh, have you dive a little bit deeper into the technology behind Planetarian. Uh, uh, well, no, we start <laughs> just a, a brief, a brief uh, run through on what what you're doing. Uh, so, uh, muscle meats uh, uh, from the byproducts. Uh, normally, the industry uses the proteins and isolates uh, for making them plant based meats. Uh, but when you isolate something, you generate other byproducts. So imagine the uh, uh, yellow pea that has only 20, uh, 22 percent of the protein. The remaining eighty percent of uh, uh, where would it go? So uh, uh, we initially helped uh, companies uh, to upcycle the byproducts uh, into uh, the whole muscle meat. And then they realized that uh, if they're able uh, to uh, process all the ingredients, not only the protein, but also uh, the uh, starches uh, into, we can prevent uh, the uh, uh, byproducts generation. And now we have the technology that allows to process the whole pulses into a bacon-like uh, fat-free uh, meat. Uh, but this is not the end. So when we realized uh, that uh, uh, pulses, actually the uh, uh, nitrogen fixing uh, uh, crops, so they can fix the nitrogen from the air uh, and use as the nutrients uh, for their own growth. Uh, that means uh, the capturing uh, and, uh, the nitrogen uh, from the air, we can fix, uh, uh, fix some others mistakes 
uh, uh, who will release these greenhouse gases into the emissions. So that's uh, what we are doing uh, at Planetarians, in short. I, I'd love to, uh, to talk more with someone else. If uh, uh, someone interested, find me on LinkedIn, uh, uh, send me a message. Uh, I'd love to collaborate. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the technology behind Planetarians is fascinating. So I really appreciate you sharing that with all of us. Um, so we touched on the consumer side of things. We, we touched on the certification. We touched a little bit on supply chain. Um, I'm really curious to dive a little bit deeper into the supply chain um, component of it, specifically renewal mill. So I know you kind of change the supply chain aspect for the business? And what are some of the core benefits of plugging the upcycled ingredients into the broader supply chain landscape? Um, I know that you, you are doing this um, to understand like what your, what your carbon footprint is from producing these ingredients, you're tracking and you're analyzing it. So how do you, how do you convey that? And how do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the way that we operate is that we work directly with the producers that are um, producing these byproducts. So we co-locate our technology at the facility where the byproduct is being produced. Um, and that helps us uh, keep costs down for transportation. And then also from a food safety angle, we're able to process it and get it from byproduct to shelf stable ingredient all before it leaves the, the factory for the first time. So it really has, um, it's, it's a really easy way to kind of plug into the um, existing uh, production line for that's, that's already being used at this facility and just basically create a new, um, a new product, which is this ingredient that we then um, handle and, and bring back into the supply chain. Um, so really we, we think of the supply chain for us starting at the moment that that pulp is produced um, or at the, the moment that that byproduct is produced. Um, and we, so, so we think about um, for our life cycle assessments and how we think about the, the environmental benefits of these uh, byproducts is basically, basically you're removing the growing phase of a substitute plant, right? Because your, your life cycle of this ingredient is starting at the moment it comes out of this machine or at the moment it comes out of this process. And that, that significantly reduces the carbon footprint of the ingredients. So we, we estimate that, for example, for um, okara flour, it has about 40% the carbon footprint of a traditional wheat flour. And that is mainly stemming from the fact that, um, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to put all those resources into growing it because it's something that, you know, we, we're counting that towards the soy milk and our, you know, this is, this is starting right at that moment of, of byproduct production. Um, so, you know, I think we, we definitely, you know, it's important to convey the sustainability piece of what we're doing. Um, so we track the number of pounds um, of food waste that's diverted. Um, we talk about the carbon um, savings of what we're doing as well. Um, we are also kind of, as a side note, certified to be plastic negative because that's also something that we, that we care about and want to be wrapped into the whole story of upcycling and being better for, for the planet. Um, but it's something that we're actively kind of working on and, and our process is kind of evolving in how we talk about the supply chain of upcycled ingredients and how that supply chain um, correlates with a better for the planet um, product. Um, and I think in general, like the general kind of one line concept of like, hey, we're using something that would otherwise be wasted. That That is something that someone can kind of understand really quickly. But um, it is it is more of a challenge to convey the nuances of like, um, you know, that some of the numbers behind it, right, that like, okay, well, this has, you know, like the one I just said, right, 40% the carbon footprint of, um, you know, if someone's not deeply engaged in wanting to know this, it can be a little bit like, uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what that means. So, so looking for ways that we can um, engage folks and customers to really understand that um, is something that, that we're continually evolving how we approach that. Um, you know, it's also something I'll just note too that that these numbers are also um, we're also tracking these for our B two B customers, so the folks that are um, purchasing the ingredient, so that we can pass along. Um, you know, our story is their story, so we can pass along those numbers and help them understand um, how does this impact their product. What can they say about um, what the environmental impact is of of utilizing the upcycled ingredient in their in their products? Wow. Uh. So interesting. Olivia, I know we just have one or two minutes left with you. Could you give us a, a brief overview of 
imperfect foods place in the supply chain? How are you how are you sourcing? How are you working with with other organizations? Yeah, I will try and keep this brief because I'm sure <laughs> I could spend a very long time on this. But I think so we've definitely evolved in the last five years. Right now, we're really trying to assert ourselves as a retailer, direct to consumer. Um, so really sort of filling a unique space that's proven to be really important during the time of COVID. Um, so for us, um, we're up to almost 400,000 customers nationwide. So I think we're leveraging this really unique platform of, I think, being customer facing, being digital, being online, and then also being a bridge between these really great and unique ingredient producers. So for us, at least where we are now, we're like a mid-sized retailer. So we're working more with co-packers on integrating these ingredients in recipes. So I think it's, we're kind of in a unique space because we don't command the volume of something, you know, like a Trader Joe's, a Whole Foods, but we're definitely not, you know, small potatoes anymore. So definitely trying to integrate these really great, unique products. And I think our, our challenge and really the biggest opportunity and need in the next decade is going to be the scalability. So that I think in terms of like making sure we have enough of these unique ingredients at a price point that's accessible, um, since our overall goal is being everyone's first and favorite, um, just value and uniqueness is going to be a big key to that. Great. Thank you so much. I know you have to sign off now. So I really appreciate your time, Olivia. We have the rest of our panelists around for a little bit longer to go through Q&A from the audience. So before we, we jump into our Q&A from the audience, if you have questions, please, um, we would love to hear them. But I would love to hear from each of the panelists, any, any final words? Is there something that we, we've missed so far? Um, and if not, a call to action would be great. I would love to kind of hear, um, you know, a call to action to, to our audience out there. Um, I'll jump in with a call and then I'll jump off. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the biggest opportunity probably for everyone on this call is just to reframe. Um, for us, it's reframing what, what is valuable. And I think that everyone on this panel, everyone in the Upcycled Food Association shows that there is, there is value in what other people just throw away. So I think it is approaching everything. Everything has a use. Everything has a use case. Let's just integrate that into something that will ideally be delicious. Um, so I'll hop off, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Olivia. Ale, any anything we've we've missed from your end so far? Uh, well, uh, I don't want to be to sound too scientific uh, here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is why a little bit uh, limiting uh, the way how we process uh, and use our solid state fermentation. So, uh, but uh, if uh, uh, if somebody thinks about the platform uh, for the CPG brand uh, on uh, the base of the alternative proteins or in the area of uh, uh, snacks uh, like uh, uh, jerky or even meats. Uh, uh, please, uh, well, actually, I can uh, post in the chart uh, my email, so you can just email me, uh, and uh, we can uh, help you uh, with uh, uh, formulation, with uh, manufacturing. So we can provide you the full uh, support if you're willing to uh, well advocate uh, these benefits of the upcycled ingredients uh, on the market. And now Great. I'm posting the, my email in the chat. Yeah. Great, thanks, Claire. What what have we what have we missed? Yeah, I I don't know that we've missed anything, but I would just reiterate, you know, that that you know it really feels like there's a lot of of momentum behind um, what's happening, and that it really feels like like 2021 is the year for upcycling. Um, and I I think Turner might agree with me on that. It, there's a lot. There's just so much that's happening and the movement is happening so fast that we're we're really excited to see this become mainstream and become mainstream pretty quickly um, because you know a circular economy really benefits all of us um, so both from a financial perspective and from the planet's point of view as well so um, so we're excited for for what's what lies ahead um, this year great I definitely do agree with you Claire I think this is the year, um, but that's what we said in 2019, and it what it felt like 2019 felt like the year, and so did 2020, and so does this year. So I think it's just growing and growing. Um, it just keeps getting better, 
And um, I would say my call to action would be like, if, if you're someone who doesn't use plastic bags at the grocery store, if you're someone who's ever thought I'm going to try to drive less or I would prefer to have a more fuel efficient car or if you're someone who's ever thought I'm going to reduce my meat consumption, then the logical, th the next logical thing to do is to buy upcycle products because, and not to, not to bash, you know, the, the electric cars and the, and the bus, uh, public trans transit or any other of the other solutions that help us address climate change. But the fact is preventing food waste is the single most important thing we can do to prevent climate change. And so if there are other things that you're already doing that take a small amount of energy, like bringing your reusable bags to the grocery store, then choosing an upcycled version of a product that you already buy and helping to prevent food waste through the products that you already buy is just the most logical way for you to, to be an environmentalist in your everyday life. So buy the, buy the upcycle products that are, that are already out there. And there are going to be many, many more uh, coming on the market in, in the very near future. So um, it should be easier and easier for us all to prevent food waste every day. Thanks for that. So now we're going to move into our audience Q&A portion. We already have great questions pouring in. So if you do have a question, please write it in the question and answer box and I will try to get it. We have about 20 minutes to get through these. So our first question, um, where the value of these byproducts increase uh, due to trend in upcycling, could there be unintended consequences of driving increased amounts of waste or at risk that uh, the attractiveness, attractiveness of these products leads to unattractiveness of others? Um, I think that's a, a pretty interesting question. Yeah, I can touch on that. Um, so I think the question is basically like, if we come to demand the proteins from uh, sunflowers or okara mm -hmm. from tofu so and soy milk production, and we need and we want so much of that stuff that it ends up causing waste of tofu or waste of sunflower seeds. Um, and the short answer is no. And the reason is that when we came up with the definition for upcycled food, um, it wasn't just Upcycled Food Association creating that definition. It was also Harvard Law School and Natural Resources Defense Council and World Wildlife Fund and ReFed and all of these environmental nonprofits that don't care at all about the success of the upcycled industry. They just want to preserve wildlife habitat and all of the you know things that um, you know preserve uh, the the truth, uh, if, as the case may be for Harvard Law School. Um, and so they designed the, the um, definition to explicitly say, and you can read it on our website, that it has to be something that otherwise would have gone to waste. And so if we reach an equi equilibrium point in which that product no longer meets that definition, no longer would have otherwise gone to waste, then it's no longer upcycled. It's no longer considered an upcycled product anymore. And another part of the definition being that it has to explicitly has to have a positive impact on the environment, which we're doing through certification. Oh, as we roll out certification over the next few years, we're going to be asking that um, that certified products and ingredients show that there's actually a net uh, net reduction of carbon emissions associated with that. Um, the, the upcycling, the use of upcycled ingredients um, in their product. And so, it, it, and if there's not a net uh, reduction in carbon emissions associated with that, then again, it doesn't meet the definition of upcycled food and it, it's not considered that any uh, upcycled food anymore. So, so um, that's why the answer to that, that's a question that we get a lot. Um, and thankfully the people who created the definition of, of upcycled food really kind of thought about that from the beginning and said, you know what, we're just going to say, if it if that if that uh, 
phenomenon does occur, we get to that point where we're at that demand equilibrium, it's just not even upcycled food anymore. Right. And so then those products uh, don't get the benefit of you know, being advocated for uh, you know, by a cycle food association, et cetera. Thanks for that. Um, so we have another question that came in. I think this is good for both Claire and Ale. When you were in the earliest stages of your companies, what was the biggest expense associated with kind of piloting these ideas? Yeah, I mean, for us, actually, I think the biggest, the biggest expense is actually for us was actually, um, you know, getting the process up and running to be able to transform these byproducts into, into ingredients. Um, because a lot of the byproducts that we, you know, we're focused primarily on these fibrous byproducts. Um, and they generally, the processes that are generating these types of byproducts are usually creating very wet byproducts. So we, we do need to dehydrate those um, to get them to be shelf stable. Um, and that's, that's not an insignificant thing to do. And so, you know, I think um, it, it was a little bit like chicken and egg problem for us at the beginning where, you know, we, we needed supply of these new ingredients and novel ingredients to get them out there to have people, you know, fall in love with them the way we were. Um, but it also was quite a bit of startup cost to, to, to even be able to produce these, by, um, these ingredients. So, um, you know, we, we took a process of kind of going little by little and, and growing slowly um, with, with some pilot operations and things like that to at least get us access to being able to get these ingredients. But I think actually the production um, is the piece that is like the, the biggest cost up front for us. Uh, well, uh, for us, uh, the biggest cost was uh, our stupidity and desire to run as many R&D experiments uh, on as many uh, byproduct streams uh, and upcycled ingredients uh, we could touch. So that's, <laughs> don't repeat our mistakes here. So focus. So that's uh, choose one. Uh, and uh, so then uh, Second thing, uh, since we were in the early days and the yuck effect, uh, all our investors uh, were asking us, uh, what would uh, consumers say if uh, they learn that you make it uh, from the food waste? So that's, uh, they will not only stop buying, but they sue you. So that's, uh, that was uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, question where we spent uh, money to manufacture chips, sunflower chips, you might saw that uh, on Amazon. So we manufactured and sold 100 servings uh, of them to prove that consumers absolutely don't care about this uh, yak effect uh, if it's uh, well delicious chips uh, and provides its uh, nutrients. So uh, yeah, you don't need uh, to do this uh, second time. Right now, everybody knows it and you just need to quantify uh, your uh, benefits and properly well, advocate on the package and then the, in communication with the consumers. So uh, uh, so that was in the very early days. But uh, when uh, you uh, want to really jump from the early adopters willing to pay premium uh, for your products and uh, you want to reach out to uh, the conservative consumers, you need to seduce them uh, with the, uh, uh, better pricing. I'm not uh, saying cheaper than the conventional, but at least on the same level, because they used to buy uh, uh, the same products. Uh, uh, and here, yes, you need to either uh, own, uh, own manufacturing, it's costly, it's capex, you need to raise money, or you need to have enough money to place a sizable order for the co-packer. So that, uh, then that means you need to freeze money in the inventory. So, but uh, if you have uh, the first steps executed properly, if you have enough data that consumers buy it, buy it on a repetitive uh, basis, the customer acquisition is uh, not that high, it's less uh, than, uh, uh, LTV, it's, let's say three times, five times, every investor will uh, give you money at, uh, to finance either inventory or your own facility. That's in short, uh, how we uh, see our expenses. Thanks for that. We have another great question. I think this is geared more towards Turner. So 
Um, it's a question about scope. What is the geographical area that the Upcycled Food Association is aiming for initially um, based on where, where the seal can be used? Also, is there going to be a focus on targeting companies that already use upcycled products first, or are you looking more towards novel companies for, for those first certifications? Yeah, and there's Francisco who asked about that too. So um, there are, Francisco, there's, there's members in Brazil already um, and, and elsewhere in South America. And, and to both questions, um, we have members in more than 20 countries around the world. And so this really is a global movement, which makes sense because it's a global supply chain and there's partnerships and, and um, businesses working together to produce and distribute food all over the world anyway. And so this is just a more sustainable way of doing what's already happening. And um, so wherever you are in the world, it's, it's the place to be involved. Start with that. For the certification, this is our first year and there's like trademarking uh, issues with the use of the logo and stuff. And so it's for this year, it's um, for businesses that sell their products in the US. So if you're based somewhere else, but you sell products in, in the United States, then you can get, or ingredients in the United States, then you can get certified this year. And we're looking to expand in the near term to, um, to elsewhere in North America, EU, Australia, and New Zealand are kind of some um, target areas, Latin America as well. And it's just sort of to meet the demand where are these companies selling their products. Um, but that'll have to be rolled out over time because again, we have to you know, deal with the, you know, the legal side of it. But for right now, anyone who sells, even if you're based somewhere else, if you sell any product or ingredient in the US, you can get certified. And again, we're gonna start accepting applications for certification um, in just a few months. So really exciting um, time for us. And um, I mean, I can't wait for people to see products on shelf um, that are certified. I think it's gonna be, that's gonna be such a cool moment um, for, for our whole movement. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that as well. Um, so on the on the supermarket side, have you any of you seen supermarkets effort in efforts in reducing waste? Um, have there been any specific policies from certain actors in the industry to either reduce waste or become also actively involved in upcycling? Okay, I can I can briefly touch on this too, and then I'll shut up. Um, and, and I know a little bit about this because before I was with Upcycle Food Association, I was the executive director of a food rescue nonprofit called Denver Food Rescue. And this is something that more people are familiar with, but it's like, and obviously very important over the last year as millions of Americans have faced food insecurity due to COVID. And it's essentially, you pick up food that otherwise would have gone to waste from a grocery store. Like they're calling the, oh, this, you know, tomato has a bruise on it or whatever. So they call it, they set it aside and organizations, tens of thousands of organizations like Denver Food Rescue do this all over the world. And then they provide that food to food insecure or low income populations. Really, really important work. Great opportunity for people to donate their uh, stimulus checks if you're here in the US uh, to your local uh, food rescue organization. And the pro it's, it's a great model, um, has it near and dear to my heart helps to address food waste and food insecurity at the same time. Um, and the problem is that it kind of has given um, retailers sort of like a cop out, like, oh, we're already reducing waste. We donate all of our leftovers to um, our local food rescue organization. And that's good and they all should be doing that. But what we really need to see is two other things. We need to see retailers stocking upcycled products. So the CPGs, renewal mill CPGs and the CPGs that are made from planetarians ingredients, we need to see those on shelf. That's, that's another thing that we need to hold retailers accountable to, to doing. We also need, uh, most retailers have their own private label. We, we need to hold them accountable so that they're creating their upcycled ingredients um, in their private label as well. So that, because as a consumer, when you walk into a grocery store, you don't really have control over if they donate their food to a food rescue organization or not. 
but you do have control over what you buy when you're there. And if they're not carrying upcycled products, then they're kind of taking your ability um, to prevent food waste while you're there in store away. And in reality, they need to be doing both. They need to be donating their, their um, excess uh, food to local um, food rescue or hunger relief agencies. And they also need to be stocking upcycled products um, so that we're kind of addressing it from, from both ends. I don't know if Ale or, or Claire agree with all of that. Um, Totally, totally. I mean, I think, you know, in general, like addressing food waste is a very, like the solution is a very multi-pronged approach and we need to be addressing it all the way from the farm to the grocery store. And there's lots of different ways that people are doing that. I think what makes upcycling um, a really exciting space to be in um, for, for addressing food waste is that it's kind of like the low hanging fruit. It's like a really easy thing that we can do right now. It gets a lot more challenging when we talk about changing consumer behavior or dealing with food um, that's already expired or, you know, getting leftovers from a restaurant, there's food safety issues around that. Um, those sorts of things are, should absolutely be happening, but are more challenging. Whereas um, if we're talking about upcycling, um, you know, byproducts into new ingredients and into new foods, it's like kind of the first like no brainer step um, in, in reducing food waste it's, is how we, we look at it. Well, uh, my understanding that uh, the retailers uh, are not uh, concerned a lot uh, because uh, the uh, expired uh, uh, products uh, is on the brand side. So uh, they do not suffer uh, much of that. What they don't get, uh, they, uh, uh, if they did not sell it, they didn't earn their margin. So uh, I see more interesting solution coming and adopting by the retailers the dynamic pricing. So uh, uh, instead of uh, my place in the half price, so that's uh, in the last day and you still have something unsold. So uh, you may uh, adjust uh, the pricing according to uh, uh, real demand, like the airlines sell their tickets. And, they, um, and this way I will eliminate, uh, so will uh, move all the products uh, at their uh, market price and uh, no extra work on their well, uh, utilization of those by, by products or uh, moving to the uh, food banks and, and, and so on. So I believe more in uh, this side, yeah, but I, I, I want more uh, retailers to be involved uh, in maybe uh, dedicating a special um, uh, section on the aisle for the upcycled produce. So that's, uh, uh, and then uh, it will give them more exposure to the new coming brands uh, that carry this uh, upcycled logo on their uh, packages. So uh, Turner, if you can work with uh, retailers on uh, this, I think a lot of brands will appreciate your efforts. Yeah, one something we're we're working on for this year, which is not like a, a dedicated section of the store, um, because there's so much diversity in in the amount of uh, products. Some are refrigerated, some are frozen, some are shelf stable. Um, but we're hopefully you'll see some shelf talkers. You know those signs that stick out into the aisle as you're walking through the aisle, and it like kind of slaps you in the face, like, look, this thing is local or whatever, you know, whatever the claim they're making is. So to really highlight, hey, there's climate change. We got to do something about this, buy this product and you're contributing to the solution. And we're, we're actually already seeing like in places where it's easy to do this, like for all online shopping, we're starting to see the upcycled tag show up on places that you might um, shop for online groceries. So like um, some of the Thrive Market and things like that are getting that upcycled tag so that you can quickly um, find everything that, that fits that uh, definition when you're shopping. Great. Um, thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. I know we had quite a diverse audience out here. We do have just a couple more questions, but before that, we are going to launch a quick poll on the screen so that that should appear on your screen. Um, we kindly ask that you provide us feedback from your experience at today's panel so we can continue to improve and bring you high quality and interesting events in the future. 
Um, I do have a couple more questions in the chat. So while you're filling that out, I'd love to ask Claire, you mentioned the processing at the, um, as the largest expense initially. So what about the hardware or equipment you need to make products? Are there any sustainability considerations when um, purchasing manufacturing equipment, for example, purchasing secondhand machinery, yep. or do you kind of compensate with other business decisions? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So um, yes, we did um, the kind of the bulk of what we bought was was secondhand. Um, you know, it's, it's it's somewhat proprietary, so we did make some modifications to it with some new stuff, but started with stuff that was secondhand. Um, but I will also say that another thing that we've been doing is actually working with the USDA to um, to see if we can transform what we're using into something that's completely running off of renewable energy. So um, basically converting it to be a solar thermal system um, and using solar arrays to, um, to basically heat uh, a heat transfer oil, which is the, the main way that we would be dehydrating the byproducts. And uh, we've done a couple of pilot tests with them and it's worked really great um, and it's really exciting. So in places where you know, we have everything kind of aligned where we have a production partner and they've got space on a roof and they're in the right kind of, um, they've got the, you know, sufficient kind of um, lack of cloud cover for us to be doing something like that. Um, we can actually make the production um, totally coming from renewable resources and, and like eliminate carbon use for the production altogether. So yes, uh, short answer is like, yes, that's absolutely something we're thinking about. Um, as a sustainability company, we're, we're infusing that, that sort of thinking into everything we're doing because as we're fixing a problem, we don't wanna be creating new ones. <laughs> well, let me contribute here. So, uh... A lot of uh, equipment manufacturers uh, thinking uh, how to improve their machinery. So uh, their business interests uh, in engaging with you, if you have a clever idea, uh, how to uh, uh, use their uh, equipment for uh, the other uh, processes, for instance, for upcycling. Uh, and a lot of them have uh, the pilot plans. So, uh, well, let me remind you once again on our uh, collaboration with the Clextral, uh, the uh, extrusion company, who allowed us uh, to use their uh, manufacturing, uh, their pilot plant to observe what we are doing, to learn from us, to improve their own machinery. And uh, such collaborations might be not that costly or uh, in, uh, maybe even free for you if you find the very good alignment uh, you know, with the uh, manufacturer. So now showing them that so you can sell more of that uh, equipment uh, for other manufacturers. So, uh, well, knock the uh, manufacturer's doors, uh, check uh, if they have the uh, pilot plans. It will save you, at least on R&D, a lot of money. Great. Well, I think that about wraps things up. Ole, Claire, Turner, thank you so much for your insights and expertise. And to our audience, thank you for joining us today. I know we had uh, quite a diverse audience here with us. So whether you're a corporation looking for ways to increase sustainability practices, a CPG brand, looking uh, where do you source your ingredients from, or maybe you're an investor considering what the direction of the food industry is going. I hope you're all leaving feeling informed and excited about the upcycling movement. I know I certainly am, and I can't wait till later this year when we start to see that certification on our shelves when we walk through grocery stores. If you have any additional questions, I'll direct you to the websites of our inspiring panelists. And if you have not yet filled out our poll, please do. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you again for joining us for our repurposing food, upcycled ingredients, and fighting food waste panel. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Jamie. Take care. Thanks, Claire.